Um, it's my privilege to introduce, great. It's uh, my privilege to introduce our speaker, Dr. Gordon Watt. Um, Dr. Gordon Watt has his uh, PhD in epidemiology from University of Texas uh, at Houston, a health science uh, center in Houston. While he was there doing his doctorate, he worked um, a lot on liver cancer um, uh, etiology and survivorship um, on the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, he then came to New York, fortunately for us, um, and has been working at Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, with Malcolm Pike and Janine uh, Bernstein in looking at um, what's called uh, background uh, parenchymal um, enhancement, which is a way to really um, evaluate um, in a more sensitive manner um, a woman's risk from uh, looking at an MRI and looking at kind of the metabolic activity within the breast tissue. So you'll hear more about that in a minute. Um, it's a very interesting biomarker that has a lot of clinical significance, particularly because of um, the um, low sensitivity of, of standard mammograms when you have um, uh, heavily bre uh, dense breasts. Um, uh, Dr. Watt just um, recently heard that he got a two percentile on his new R1, uh, looking again at this kind of unique biomarker, both within um, stored images at Memorial, as well as recruiting new women in the Netherlands. So you'll hear a little bit more about this. And because of the percentile, it will probably be switched to an R37, which is um, a nice thing that the NCI has for um, uh, really high scoring grants or low scoring. I never know which way to do for that. So again, Dr. Watt is um, someone who focuses on population science, survivorship issues, um, ways to um, do improved risk assessment. Um, and it's really um, our pleasure to host you today. So thank you so much, Dr. Watt. All right, thank you, Dr. Terry. And um, thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Gerald, for all your help getting set up. And uh, it's really a pleasure to be here at Columbia. I've actually never been here. I've been here five years in New York and never make it to this side of town. But um, I'm Gordon, I'm an epidemi epidemiology instructor in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at MSK. And today I'm going to uh, break my talk into basically two parts. I'm first gonna talk about um, imaging markers of first and second primary cancers. And specifically, I'll get into the specific questions in a minute. Then I'm gonna to switch to the genetic predictors of cancer late effects, which are broadly speaking, the long-term outcomes after cancer treatment attributable to chemotherapy, radiation therapy, endocrine therapy, and so on. So just to start, survivors of cancer uh, go through a lot during treatment and they have an increased risk of a number of so-called late effects. Uh, I'll be focusing primarily on the risks of uh, is this subsequent cancers and uh, heart disease. And the epidemiology of these effects is really interesting because it depends, first of all, on the patient factors, your genetics, your family history, and so on, the type of the first cancer, the treatment re you receive, and then your access to and type of follow-up care you receive. So it's a really interesting um, multifaceted epidemiological question. So from these many late effects that survivors deal with, I wanted to first start with one specific outcome, and this is second primary contralateral breast cancer, or CBC. These are independent second primary cancers that occur in the opposite breast of the first cancer. And so to clarify, these are not metastases and they're not recurrences, they're new primary cancers. These second cancers have worse outcomes than first cancers, and they're associated with a reduced lifespan. And on top of that, uh, between five and 10% of survivors are expected to um, be diagnosed with a second primary cancer. So with 4 million breast cancer survivors in the US alone, this is actually a, a relatively big public health problem. And it's really important to understand who has the high risk of CBC so we can target persistent prevention and screening to these um, most vulnerable women. So just for some background, uh, CBC has been pretty extensively studied uh, in certain pockets. And there are a number of established risk factors. In the category of patient factors, we know that um, the high penetrance pathogenic mutations in BRCA1, BRCA2, and PALV2 also are associated with an increased risk of CBC. There's certain common genetic variants, which I'll be speaking about, that also increase or, or predict the risk of CBC. Certain reproductive factors influence the risk. And I'm also, I also do some research investigating why non-Hispanic, Black, and Hispanic survivors of, of uh, first breast cancers have an increased risk of CBC, despite a similar incidence of first breast cancer risk. Um, but to start, I'd like to focus on mammographic density 
and imaging markers from breast imaging that might identify individuals with an increased risk of CBC. Okay, so the specific question is, what are the biomarkers on mammogram that predict CBC risk? And mammographic density, which probably everyone here has, is familiar with, is, was first described as a risk marker for future breast cancer in the 80s and 90s. And since then, it's become a, a central feature of breast cancer risk stratification and risk assessment. Those with high mammographic density have between a two and fourfold increased risk of breast cancer, making this one of the strongest risk factors for breast cancer outside of these high penetrance variants. And you can see here that when you have very high density, category C and D, it also not only increases the risk, but has a masking effect. So when you go for your mammogram, it will be harder to visualize a tumor. So this is a really important uh, population for persistent screening and alternative um, screening modalities. But again, I'm looking at second primary cancers and um, it's not really clear whether mammographic density is an equally predictive marker for this population. Um, they already have a high risk, they've already had a cancer. So does mammographic density really add anything to that? And I've been working with the Women's Environment, Cancer, and Radiation Epidemiology, or eCare, study, um, which was designed specifically to identify the risk factors for CBC for survivors of a first breast cancer. So the study population includes folks who are identified with or diagnosed with a first primary breast cancer, which was unilateral, stage one to two. And then they were they survived at least a year. And then the cases were those who developed a second cancer in the contralateral breast. And then they were matched to controls who had no second cancer. So everyone here had a cancer, they were all treated for it, and they all survived at least a year. The cases then had a second cancer. Here's a whole bunch of information about the study, which I'm not gonna go into too much detail about, but basically um, there were over 3000 participants recruited over two study phases by my postdoc mentor, uh, Janine Bernstein and her international collaborative group. All women were less than 55 years of age at first diagnosis. So this is sort of a younger population than the average um, breast cancer patient. They were recruited from the United States, uh, Canada, and Denmark. And the outcome of interest, of course, was CBC. So for each participant, comprehensive data were collected. Uh, most importantly for now is that everyone in the second phase um, gave permission to collect their mammograms, both before their first breast cancer and after treatment for their first breast cancer, which allows for a lot of interesting questions to be answered. So a basic question is whether for this population of survivors with a high inherent risk, um, does mammographic density predict breast cancer? This is a paper that came out the year before I started at MSK. Um, so recall that participants had a first breast cancer in one breast. The study team used the other breast to measure mammographic density and other factors. So we're basically looking at the unaffected breast for these survivors. Here you can see that when you look at mammographic density prior to diagnosis of the first breast cancer, there's really no association um, that reaches statistical significance, at least, um, with standard mammographic density, which is sort of surprising. It's a really strong risk factor, um, but after treatment and everything, the risk profile changes. You can see that there is a uh, significant but somewhat weaker association with breast density, uh, at, between breast density and CBC for the mammograms that were taken after treatment for the first breast cancer. Does that make sense? So basically, um, there's an association there. It probably isn't the most powerful marker of risk in this specific population. So I was interested in other measures of mammogram and whether they might improve um, our ability to identify those with a really high risk of a CBC. Yeah. Are they the same breast? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for cases, it was the breast that eventually developed the cancer, and for controls, it was just the unaffected. Did they have a look at the data to see any differences? I mean, I don't know how much variability there is across breast cancer, but in those who didn't get breast cancer in that breast, did you also look to see the difference? Um, between from before to after? No, between the like the breast up. Oh, the they actually initially didn't even measure mammographic density on the affected breast because the tumor was there and this. Uh... Oh, I was thinking you had fiber. Oh yeah, um, no, okay. no, I don't. I don't think so. They are right, but yeah, I was just I'd be interested in the fact that they did get the yeah. yeah, no, no, it's okay. No, it's a good question. And at the uh, the breast density conference uh, in Hawaii last year, there was some evidence that breasts that develop cancer um, decline in density more slowly than those that don't. So there is something there, probably, um, just outside of what I've <laughs> been able to do. <laughs> so. Um, 
Our collaborative group at the University of Melbourne have developed these sort of modified measures of mammographic density. So whereas uh, standard mammographic density captures all of the white or bright areas on the mammogram, these modified measures, first of all, altocumulus captures only the brighter areas within that patch of density. And then this measure called serocumulus captures only the very brightest spots on this unaffected breast. And in some screening populations in the, um, in the South Pacific, there's been some evidence that this might be a better marker than center density. So for this higher risk population, we thought maybe this would work better for survivors too. So here's the study design of this. Basically, we're using the We Care study of survivors. We used mammograms taken prior to the first breast cancer to start uh, because it was before treatment. It's not um, mixed up with all the treatment effects, declines after chemotherapy and so on. And I standardized the measures uh, to enable comparisons of serocumulus, allocumulus, and cumulus all side by side to see which is the, has the strongest gradient of risk with CPC. And then I developed some multivariable models of CPC risk for each of these measures alone and in combination. So you can see here that there's four models in the top three. Each of the uh, measures was fit uh, in a multivariable model alone, basically. So cumulus, altocumulus, and serocumulus in three different models, they were all associated with CPC risk. But it seems like alto or serocumulus had the strongest uh, effect. It also had the best model fit, as you can see. And then when you combine them in one model, something really interesting happens. The effect of serocumulus remains, but the other two measures go, uh, basically attenuate down to a null. And this indicates, at least to me, and I think some others, that serocumulus is basically capturing all of the um, variation and risk attributable to breast density. You don't need the rest of the um, non-bright areas really to get this, the same level or better prediction than, than density alone. So this is really interesting, and it starts to enter our question about what are the best biomarkers for mammogram that predict CBC risk, this very high intensity density measure called serocumulus. But these mammograms are a really rich resource for other quantitative data, and we can use the images to derive other measures as well. So then I led a study deriving these so-called texture features from the mammograms taken from the We Care study. And again, this is the unaffected breast. So we're just looking at the healthy parenchyma here. So Whereas mammographic density quantifies the amount of bright versus non-bright pixels in an image, texture features can quantify the pattern and arrangement of pixel intensities across the breast. And there's increasing evidence that sort of the way that the tissue is arranged in the breast is important for determining um, risk of breast cancer. These texture features were actually originally defined in like geology and ecology context, but then have been translated to biomedical imaging in the last uh, decade or two. So basically, I'm not gonna go through the actual process, but we standardized and um, calculated a number of texture features based on the established methods, and then used penalized regression in the subset of the data to identify a texture risk score. And then this risk score was gonna be used to predict the risk of CPC in the rest of the data. And in fact, we, the risk of CPC when regressed on the texture risk score with adjustment for the factors in the table was associated um, with CPC. So you can see that a one unit increase in the adjusted standard deviation of the texture risk score was associated with a 31% increased risk of CBC. It's a bit higher than um, cumulus density, similar to serocumulus actually, but they're, they're not correlated. And then we regressed the texture risk score and cumulus density together there in model three and found that the texture risk score sort of maintained the association, but the association with density was attenuated. So again, it's capturing some of what density is capturing but what's nice is that this is a fully automated method. It's defined mathematically, and it's easier to replicate than you know using cumulus for density. Although, as everyone, as some in the audience know, we're automating density pretty well these days too. So, these are two markers from mammogram that I think can help improve our prediction of those that have the highest risk of CPC, moving beyond standard density and our the known risk factors. I'm just gonna keep moving um, since we're, I know we have to get out of here right at noon. Um, but there are also, for a lot of higher risk individuals, supplemental screening modalities that are used in addition to and alongside mammogram to improve detection of cancers. So the next question is, are there novel markers from supplemental screening that might improve prediction of breast cancer risk? And 
again, imaging is really central to breast cancer screening and prevention, and we're gradually moving towards personalized or risk-based screening. Women with average risk typically begin their mammogram around age 40 and either go every one year or every two years, depending on where you are in the world. And then there are these higher risk women who are recommended to begin mammogram earlier, get a, get a baseline exam earlier, and then receive supplemental uh, uh, screening, usually with uh, contrast enhanced breast MRI. The high risk indicators are a history of chest radiation, for example, um, survivors of childhood cancers or Hodgkin lymphoma, uh, a personal history of breast cancer, less than 55, 50 years of age, which is basically the entire population of the We Care, we care study, pathogenic variants, family history, and then there's clinical trials in progress to see whether high breast density really would, um, women with high breast density would really benefit from intensive MRI-based screening. So. Breast MRI, though, is the most commonly used supplemental screening modality today, and it involves the capture of a series of images, followed by the injection of a contrast agent, and then another series of post-contrast images. And then on MRI, uh, radiologists will measure the BIRADS FGT category. BIRADS is a standard um, nomenclature for these measures, and FGT is basically analogous to uh, mammographic density. They also measure this... Um, a uh, measure called background parenchymal enhancement, which is degree, the degree to which the fibroglandular tissue enhances or brightens after the administration of contrast. Here you can see the range of BPE ranging from minimal to mild to moderate and marked. I don't know why the American College of Radio Radiology decided to make them all M words, but they did. So that's what we're working with. And there was some early evidence that not only is BPE responsive to hormonal changes in the breast, but also that it's associated with the risk of future breast cancer in these sort of small clinical studies. So the, I, the idea was to comprehensively evaluate whether BPE is in fact a new risk factor for breast cancer, or at least a marker. Um, the IMAGINE study was also set up by my postdoc mentor and mentors, Janine Bernstein and Malcolm Pike. Uh, these were participants had no prior history of cancer in this case, and they received a bilateral contrast enhanced uh, MRI at one of three sites in the US. And then the case women had a new diagnosis of a unilateral breast cancer at the time of the MRI or after. The controls never had any cancers diagnosed. And then they were matched on basically the recruitment and design uh, factors. And then um, basically the outcome was breast cancer case control status. And we were gonna look at whether BPE predicted the presence of cancer independently of FGT, mammographic density, and other known risk factors. What's novel about this study is that we're looking at this imaging marker, but when the radiologist looks at the MRI, they're going to know right away whether or not the patient has cancer because they can see the tumor on the breast. So here you can see the affected and unaffected breast of the case and the two unaffected breasts of the controls. We did the BPE assessment in the unaffected breast and then selected a random laterality for the controls. So this is what the radiologists saw. They just saw an unaffected breast. So that re removes the potential bias upwards of BPE for the cases versus the controls. And this was sort of a, a methodological improvement in the existing literature at the time. So here's the primary results from that study. For premenopausal women, we found that those with moderate or marked BPE had a 1.5 times increased odds of breast cancer relative to, to those with minimal and marked BPE. And it was for postmenopausal women, we actually changed the categorization because around the time of menopause, BPE declines quite a bit. So it, it turned out that the best um, cutoff here was comparing mild, moderate, or marked to minimal BPE. So we concluded that when, we're, when we account for these other risk factors, when we get rid of the possibility of case control bias in the assessment of BPE, that BPE does seem to be a, a risk factor for um, breast cancer. But another opportunity to improve the study was to get rid of the um, radiologist assessment entirely, remove the intra observer variability completely. So the, our collaborators at the University of Pennsylvania, who was led by Despina Contos, who's actually setting up her lab here next year, um, they've been developing a fully automated measure of FGT for a number of years and recently added uh, BPE to this measure. So basically, first, they program outlines the breast, you can see in green. It then identifies the pixels, or actually, in this case, voxels, since we're looking at 3D images that are FGT. 
And then finally, it looks at the change in intensity of the voxels from pre-contrast to post-contrast. And this is BPE. We weren't really sure exactly what was the best definition, though. So we have every pixel, we have a percent change in the intensity from pre to post. So I basically developed these um, definitions. BP extent, we're, we're, we're defining as the percent of FGT enhancing more than 20% from pre to post. And then BP intensity is the median percent change in FGT from pre to post. So BP extent sort of captures the uh, amount of enhancement and then intensity sort of captures the absolute intensity and in enhancement across the breast. So then we took these measures and saw whether if you automate BPE measurement, if it still is associated with breast cancer in the imagined study. So here again, we separated the analysis by menopausal status since um, we thought it would modify the association. It turned out that it did. Um, for women with a BPE in the third tertile, they had an 80% increased odds of breast cancer relative to those in the first. And that was the same for pre and post menopausal women. You can see here the interaction p-value was not significant. And so really, this shows that BPE is really a promising marker. This is a case control study, but there has been a prospective study using BIRADS radiologist BPE in the um, Breast Cancer Surveillance Consortium, which is prospective, showing similar things. So we're becoming increasingly confident that BPE is a real marker of an increased risk, a phenotype, if you will, of um, high risk, uh, a high risk phenotype for the breast. I'm really interested now in seeing whether these effects are consistent in survivor populations who make up a lot of the high-risk screening um, that we see. So we can add um, that there are novel markers potentially from supplemental screening that might improve prediction of breast cancer risk, and this is BPE. And whether it was measured by radiologists or using our new machine learning approach, BPE predicted the odds of breast cancer. So recall that MRI is really only indicated for high-risk women. And even for those women, um, only a, a subset of them actually ever get an MRI. There's cost concerns. It's, there are, MRI is only offered in specialty centers. You have to be able to accommodate the magnet. So um, it's, it's, just, it's not going to work for everyone in a population-wide screening program. But there is a potential to use what's called contrast-enhanced mammogram in its place. And this is basically a straightforward modification of a standard mammogram setup. Um, an analogous MRI, it uses contrast agent to increase the brightness of tumors against the background of the background of the fibroglandular tissue. So for this reason, it's really great for women who have high breast density. There are a few trials underway to sort of corroborate the observational evidence that CEM will improve survival for women with dense breasts. If they get screening by CEM. So basically, in the last couple of years, I established this pilot feasibility study to see if we could collect CEMs at MSK, where I'm currently working. And we collected about 1,000 images. We did a case control study. And we're working on developing an automated measure of BPE. And then using this data, I proposed this R01, which was scored uh, really well. And it's going to begin next year um, to further evaluate the, uh, the association between quantitative automated BPE measured on contrast enhanced mammogram and breast cancer risk. You can see here that this is a really multidisciplinary study. Um, I work closely with my buddy Krishna, who is a deep learning expert, our radiologist collaborators at MSK, Jenna Sung and Maxine Yakelson, and our my uh, epidemiology collaborator, Janine, as well as our second site PI, Mark Lobs, who is going to be recruiting participants from the Netherlands and, at his practice. He's sort of the global expert in implementation and interpretation of CEM. So the basic idea is to develop a new measure of quantitative BPE. We want to use the same principles as we did for MRI, but it's a totally different technology. So we have to kind of uh, do a new method to estimate the change in intensities from um, pre to post. And then we'll determine whether you know the compression of mammogram affects BPE, whether the X-ray energies or the filters used on the machines affect it. And then we'll do a case control study to see whether uh, this quantitative BPE improves breast cancer risk assessment. And basically, um, I'm ex excited to get this started. We already have some of the data collected at MSK, and then we'll begin collecting more data, and we should have some results in the next few years. So again, adding to our second question here, I think that if we can show that BPE measured on CEM is an equally or a better predictor than M BPE measured on MRI, this could really open up the door to um, improving risk assessment for uh, folks that can't access MRI, which is a lot of people, um, especially in the US, who have uh, cost barriers. So 
Um, I'm about to change tack a little bit. Can I answer any questions? Yes. Yeah. So here, um, sorry. My question is about not seeing differences by menopausal status with your marker. Yeah. Um, and I think you said previously it was associated with hor hormonal factors. So it, yeah. that seems a little contradictory. So if you right. could expand yeah. on that. Believe me, I have been thinking about this a lot. BP declines um, at menopause, but there's still a very nice normal distribution of BPE values for postmenopausal women. So the, sh the distribution is shifted to the left, basically. And so the, ac the actual gradient of risk is the same um, for pre- and postmenopausal women, even though the average is lower. That makes sense. Um, there's no actual statistical interaction going on. But yeah, we were surprised. We thought that it would work a lot better for um, premenopausal, actually. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're still working on it for sure. But yeah, go ahead. I was just going to ask I think in the model you adjusted for like fibroglandro volume or fat. So this is all independent yep. of density. So BPs are like a completely separate mm -hmm. predictor of risk. Yep. Are the two correlated? So people that have. Um, high BP are also more likely to have high density or is there like a completely different risk factor? In, in BIRADS, clinical, radiological, um, it, it is correlated because the radiologists see FGT and then they see BPE. And so if they have more FGT, automatically they kind of see more BPE as well because there's more tissue to enhance. But we define BP extent such that it would be independent of FGT. So it's the amount of FGT enhancing more than 20%. So yeah, we're thrilled by this result, frankly. And um, it looks like it's really promising. If you just look at the total volume of BPE without accounting for the amount of FGT, that's also a really strong predictor, but it's totally confounded by the amount of FGT present, which can be okay for prediction. But in terms of getting down to the what BPE is, we wanted it to be independent. Yes. So is it the serocumulus? Was it the last one? Yeah. Do you think that might just be picking up initial tumors? It could be. Although I just what <laughs> a lot of these cancers develop like twenty years later. So um, what cancers can develop? Yeah. For that so long. it could be, and so, you know, serocumulus is great, and it's it's going to be nice, I think, for understanding why density is is a risk factor for breast cancer, but you know, with emerging deep learning models, it sort of captures that serocumulus already. Um, yeah, no one really knows why. I think it's it's a very highly dense, compacted part of the breast. Um, and it's also, it could be a, a beginning of a tumor. I just wonder if there was any study ever to biopsy that area or just see if there could be a little DCIS going on. I don't there, know. There have been anyway. biopsy studies, yeah. I mean, I'm sure you know. It's just so hard to target the right tissue um, in the healthy breast. Um, I'd love to do it. Yeah. sometime. I think the ideal population for that would be women who received a contralateral prophylactic mastectomy and then sample that to tissue. Anyway, let's talk. Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So I'm going to switch to, again, to survivors, but I'm going to talk about genetic factors that um, influence the risk of um, late effects. And the first thing I want to talk about is going back to contralateral breast cancer. Which survivors have an increased risk of treatment-associated second primary cancers? And so a little background. Um, again, we're looking at the WeCare study where the, the population is women who had a first unilateral breast cancer. They were treated with chemotherapy, about half of them received radiation therapy, and the cases got a second cancer, and the controls did it. So here I'm going to be looking at specifically the stray radiation dose received to the contralateral breast. This is unwanted radiation dose that arises during treatment for the, the affected breast. So this healthy breast might be exposed to radiation from the RT beams directly. It might be, it might be um, uh, 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 exposed to dose from leakage from the head of the collimator. It might be exposed to scatter radiation um, with, with tissue. And it might be associated, it might be, might be coming from scatter radiation from treatment accessories. Back in the day, um, they used to use uh, physical wedges to reduce the dose or to target the dose to the treated breast, but that actually caused increased scatter dose to the contralateral breast. Those are not really used anymore, but there is still a range of stray radiation dose to the untreated breast during radiation therapy. So 
we know that the exposure of healthy tissue to radiation dose increases the risk of cancer. That's pretty much universal across tissue sites, but it depends on the amount of radiation absorbed. So you really need to understand a the actual dose absorbed to understand the risk. So the weaker study, again, was set up to answer this question. And um, the team collected uh, samples, saliva and blood for genotyping. But they also went back and did individual dose symmetry, which is basically estimating the dose of the, the untreated breast. And using radiation oncology records, the dose to the congelateral breast was reconstructed for each participant. For the older participants in the 80s, that was paper records that MD Anderson went through and, and reconstructed the dose. Um, but basically, we're not really interested in the treated breast here. We're more interested in the untreated scattered dose. And the doses were estimated for the four quadrants and the clot positions, the areola region, as well as the location for the cases where the CBC later developed. We call this the location-specific dose. And in radiation epidemiology, this is uh, somewhat standard, but basically, for each matched control, the team also measured the dose to that same location of the breast to basically equalize any differences um, and get a more precise uh, appreciation for the relationship between actual dose received to the tissue and the risk of the cancer developing in that spot. So all of the analyses I'll be presenting from here out use this location-specific dose, which tends to be a stronger have a stronger association than just average across the breast. So. In general, the people who are younger when they're exposed to radiation are more radiosensitive. And so we looked at whether um, time at diagnosis was, was or modified the association between stray radiation dose and um, CBC risk. This unit here, GY, stands for gray, and this is the measure of absorbed dose to the tissue. And we wait five years before counting any of the contralateral breast cancers because there's a latency period when after a radiation therapy to, to see any cancer associated effects or at least in a study this size, you have to wait a while. So for the younger women, less than 40 years of age, receiving one gray or more of radiation dose to the contralateral breast was associated with a twofold increased risk of CBC relative to those that didn't receive any dose. And then for women who are 40 years or more of it, years of age when they received treatment, there was no association with radiation dose, which is great news for most cancer patients. Um, but for the younger women, we really wanna be uh, con con uh, conscious of this and understand who has the greatest risk of radiation associated disease. So um, basically we know right at the bat that if you are less than 40 years of age when you receive RT, and if you get more than one gray to the breast, you have an increased risk. And potentially this, this is a population for, um, you know, uh, supplemental screening, more intensive screening for contralateral breast cancer moving forward. Mm -hmm. But I would like to talk a little bit about the biology of radiation associated cancer, which sort of informs the research approach here. The mechanism of radiation associated cancer is really complex, but um, one of the primary drivers of malignancy is DNA damage. Specifically, radiation tends to introduce DNA double strand breaks. So both strands of DNA are broken. And these are more difficult to repair than single strand breaks, which may arise with chemotherapy more often. So this DNA damage may lead to cell death, which is great if you're treating a tumor. Uh, if it's repaired correctly, then the cells continue dividing regularly, and that's great too. But if it's unsuccessful, then this can increase the risk of malignancy and uncontrolled growth. And again, this is a very simplified overview of, of this process. but Basically, we were interested in the uh, mechanism that's responsible for repairing these double strand breaks, which is the non homologous end joining DNA repair pathway, or NHEJ. And there's some laboratory evidence and epidemiological evidence that deficiencies in this repair pathway uh, are associated with developing cancers. So we were interested in whether common genetic variation in these genes in the NHEJ pathway modify the association between stray radiation dose and CBC. So we're going to be looking at um, also, well, I guess I'll, I'll just show you. <laughs> um, basically, we develop a polygenic risk score um, using these SNPs, and um, it was developed with these um, these seven genes. We basically did a linear combination of the effects of the of each SNP and developed this NHEJ PRS. We then divided them. Well, first of all, and remember, we're going back to just this very vulnerable population that was treated when they were less than 40 years of age. So we're gonna look at whether this PRS modifies the um, radiation associations in this group specifically. 
So here you can see the multivariable model of the association between radiation dose and CPC risk stratified by the score on the NADJ PRS. For those with a low score or less than the median, there was really no association between the one between receiving one gray or more in CPC. But for those that who had a high score, there was a threefold risk of receiving um, associated with receiving one gray or more. So this goes to show that even though we have basically been saying that if you're younger, you have a higher risk, it's really only certain women that have these changes in the NHEJ pathway um, genetic variants. So in combination with some other considerations, tools like this might one day help us identify the population that uh, might need a little more intensive screening and those that really we're not gonna be too worried about um, developing a second cancer. And I'm this is really um, appealing to me because it's based in the biology of the actual, the etiology of CBC. So we know that younger women and those that receive a higher dose and also those that have this higher score in this DNA repair pathway have the highest risk of CBC. And then I just, I wanna finish within the next seven or eight minutes. So I'm gonna switch to my last topic. We're still looking at survivors of breast cancer, but this time I wanna look at the risk of coronary artery disease. Um, Dr. Terry and I were discussing how um, survivors of breast cancer, the main concern is really dying of heart disease because of the exposure to radiation therapy, the exposure to chemotherapy, um, and sometimes the exposure to certain endocrine therapies and who knows about immune therapies going forward. So um, this is a really important uh, uh, topic for survivorship. And so radiation therapy specifically also does increase the long-term risk of coronary artery disease. Uh, there's a lot of direct tissue damage on the micro and macro scale. There is some DNA damage as well. And then this leads to basically a pro-inflammatory state, a pro-atherosclerotic state in the, in the heart. And that can, can also lead to fibrosis and otherwise stiffening and tightening of the vessels in the, in the heart. And this leads to your long-term risk of coronary artery disease. So we use sort of this unique study design to test the association between radiation dose and long-term coronary artery disease risk. And this was part of a, a master's thesis. Um, uh, Lauren Carlson, who was a student here at Columbia under Dr. Terry. So I sort of co-supervised this thesis and we took the We Care study we limited it to those that had received radiation therapy. And we excluded those that had a prior history of coronary artery disease. And our exposure was the laterality of the radiation therapy, whether left or right. The We Care study does not have detailed dosimetry to the heart. We don't know what parts of the heart received what dose. But we do know that left-sided radiation therapy exposes the heart on average to a greater dose than the right-sided, which makes sense. So. What's really cool about this design though, is that it's essentially, laterality is essentially a randomly allocated exposure. So it's almost analogous to a trial. There's no confounders because there's nothing that's associated with laterality of your first breast cancer. So um, we, still are, we still adjust for things um, like the study design, but um, it's a really nice clean design from an observational study. So the outcome of interest was self-reported coronary artery disease, including heart attack, coronary heart disease or angina, which required medication. And we followed up participants from the first breast cancer until diagnosis of coronary artery disease. We centered at second cancers, including contralateral breast cancer to avoid the complication of second exposures to radiation therapy and chemo, which we don't have as good data on. And then developed um, survival models to see what, um, whether or not this actually predicted risk. So we did find that left-sided radiation therapy was associated with a 2.5 times increased hazard of long-term coronary artery disease risk in this population. So the, uh, at 25 years, the cumulative incidence of coronary artery disease, which is quite severe, was over 10% for those who received left-sided radiation therapy and about 5% for those who did not, who received right-sided radiation therapy. So with this baseline, um, this is really useful potentially for stratifying risk right away, but I was interested in whether we could further stratify those with the, act, the, the um, increased risk of coronary artery disease. And um, basically I, this is like, I did this last week, so I'm excited to share it, but um, a polygenic score for coronary artery disease uh, could improve risk stratification for radiation associated coronary artery disease. I used this published work of a meta-analysis of coronary artery disease and over a million participants they used LDPRED, which is this sort of new machine learning way to select the best subset of SNPs to develop a, a polygenic risk score. And there's this 
trend of you just using as many SNPs as possible because it's really cheap and easy to get whole genome genotyping done these days. So there's really no benefit to limiting it to, you know, the top 50 most significant SNPs because you do get minimal but added value of adding these um, lower value SNPs. So this was developed in, in the 1.2 million individuals. It was evaluated in a study from Sweden. And then I took these effect estimates and um, developed a polygenic risk score in the We Care study. So overall, unselected for treatment, the CAD PRS was associated with um, a threefold increase of CAD for those in the CAD in the top tertile of this polygenic risk score. So that was actually quite a bit um, stronger than I, I expected, just because it's a very different population. Um, the baseline risks are just so different from an unselected population. But you can see that the cumulative incidence is quite a bit higher for those with a higher score on this um, PRS. But I was really specifically interested in whether this PRS modified the association between laterality of RT and CAD risk, whether it, mod what it, whether it interacts with radiation receipt. Because this PRS wasn't developed with that in mind, but um, wanted to see whether it could be useful. So here, the associations between laterality are stratified by score on the PRS. So for those with a um, PRS below the median, there was no association between laterality of radiation therapy and um, coronary artery disease risk. For those with a coronary artery disease PRS above the median, there was an association. There's a 2.5 fold increased risk, similar to what we saw kind of overall. And I acknowledge that these are sort of small numbers, but um, the interaction p-value for this, the likelihood of ratio test with and without the interaction term was 0.05, um, even with these small numbers. And this study was not powered for that. So I'm somewhat convinced by this interaction. And I, looking forward, I'm really interested in sort of validating this approach in other populations of survivors who receive large radiation doses, specifically Hodgkin lymphoma survivors who are diagnosed young and live a long time after treatment. So that's what I'm sort of thinking for the next steps here um, with this PRS. And just to sum up, what I've talked about today, in part one, we looked at imaging markers of second breast cancers, and I introduced the concept of background parenchymal enhancement, which might be translated better to um, a contrast enhanced mammogram for a broader population, and then spoke about some of the genetic predictors of second primary contralateral breast cancer and radiation-associated coronary artery disease. And I would just like to um, heartily thank uh, everyone I've been able to work with over the last few years at Sloan Kettering, particularly my co-mentors during my postdoc, who are Janine and Malcolm, and with whom I still work really tightly, and our whole team at um, Sloan Kettering, and all of the funding that made this possible. And I think I've left a few minutes uh, for questions. Um, questions? Um, we may have some online. Will you read them uh, if they're online? Sure. Laura, are there any questions um, in the chat? I'll start. Um, Not yet. That was fantastic. So thank you so much. That was really um, a very thorough review of all the impactful work you've done over the last few years. Um, I had a question just about this contralateral breast cancer design. And I know you didn't design the study, so, yeah. <laughs> but I'd like to know your thoughts since you've worked on it now in terms of... Uh, the issue of immortal time bias mm. and how you kind of think about who to enroll and what kind of assumptions to make about excluding people. So with immortal time bias, you're talking about sort of competing risks and how they're excluded rather than accounted for. Yeah. Um, the competing risks here are really, I, I suppose you could um, include other second cancers and death. And, uh, I did use a standard uh, Cox proportional hazard model, model here, um, but when you do sort of a fine and gray competing risks model, it's not really all that different. So that to me suggests that immortal time bias isn't a huge factor here, but this is in general a healthier than average population of survivors. They were younger when they were diagnosed, so they might have a higher inherited risk, but they also had to survive a year. So um, the prevalence of coronary artery disease, though elevated, is lower than you expect for the general population of cancer survivors. So these are important caveats to keep in mind. I think with the We Care study though, um, it's a really nice design. There's really no other resource like it at the moment, especially with genotyping. So um, I don't know, I, I, don't, I, I don't consider it a huge threat, the validity. 
Great talk. Um, I just had a question more about the population, the We Care study. Um, since you were looking at coronary artery disease, yep. I'm just curious about the racial and ethnic background and also the proportion of your um, participants that had like obesity and, you know, related com comorbidities related to your outcome. Yeah. Uh, the We Care study is not very diverse. It's overwhelmingly about 85% women of European ancestry. And uh, I mean, the population comes from Canada, the US and Denmark. Um, so it's really underpowered to un understand whether there's interaction between, for example, radiation receipt and long-term risk of CAD. But um, we did not find any interactions between, for example, adiposity or even receipt of chemotherapy um, with the laterality results. Um, my uh, mentor Janine and her team, they are working on uh, doing a basically a consortium of consortiums to recruit to um, to develop a study of black survivors of breast cancer, which they've submitted, I think, twice, um, haven't yet been funded for, but it's, it's in work. It's in the process. The risk factors, the magnitude of effects and the population attributable risks for second primary breast cancer could differ within these groups, although the magnitude of effect might be might be the same. And just for example, the, the magnitude of, of effect for density differs by, if you look at different parts of the world, because the other risk factors differ. So um, good question. Unfortunately, I can't really answer it. Yes. I thought that was uh, the, the both presentations, both uh, aspects of your work were fascinating to hear about. I, I was particularly interested in the contralateral work because I think it's just a fascinating, almost like natural experiment at some level, I suppose. And um, so the so the, it was interesting, the risk for the contralateral that you found, it was very different um, one way or the other. But I was, but you said laterality was randomly, effectively randomly assigned I wonder if you could expand on that just a little bit and tell us a little bit more about that and sort of what are the limitations of that? And, and perhaps if you've tested that to try to determine that random assignment. Yeah. Yeah, I should be I should tread carefully here. I can't prove okay. that like there's nothing that determines laterality of breast cancer. There there probably is a a, a small effect of something. Um, but basically we don't we can't identify any factors that are associated with laterality of breast cancer. It's slightly more pre uh, prevalent, and I believe the left versus right, like 51 versus 49% in the population. Um, but yeah, basically, so this, this was conceptualized as a, essentially a random exposure. Like there's no confounders that are associated both with laterality of the treatment and with CAT. There's just, there's nothing that we know of at least. That has that could qualify as a confounder, um, so that's that's it. Yeah, it's a it's a really nice design because and it, it's been done. I didn't invent this. It's been done in other settings before, um, but it's it's rare that you get an observational study where, that you can treat almost like a trial. Yeah, so that's all. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Doctor Wark. That was a great talk. Thank you, everyone. Great. Thanks. <laughs> Appreciate it.